Hello, Change Now. How are you? Yeah? Are we ready to change now? Yes, yes, yes. Hopefully by the end of this session, they are going to be even louder because today's session is how we take action for the ocean. I am your moderator and host for this session. My name is Elizabeth Corse, and I am a climate communicator. But today, we are here to talk about oceans. And to get us started, can I have a show of hands? Who lives by the ocean? Keep your hands up. Can you add your hands? No, keep your hands up. Uh, who has been to the ocean? Who has eaten something from the ocean? Keep your hands up. And finally, who has breathed air this morning? Yeah? Okay, well, the, the good thing is that every second breath that you take comes from the ocean. And that is why we need to protect it. So, to welcome our first speaker, she believes that the key to restoring the health of our ocean is supporting young leaders and innovators who are developing cutting-edge solutions. Over the past decade, she has built a leading international nonprofit, which is the world's largest network of ocean leaders, even launching the world's first ever Ocean Solutions Accelerator. She has been recognized for her work by former US Secretary John Kerry, US President Bill Clinton, and EU Commissioner Carmen Nuvella. Here to help us understand how each of us can play an impactful role in ocean sustainability, and you are going to hear an Ocean's First announcement, an Ocean Space First announcement. She is Daniela Fernandez, founder and CEO of Sustainable Ocean Alliance, and she is your keynote speaker today. Please put your hands together. Hello, Change Now. It is so exciting to be here with all of you today. I'd like to kick off this incredible event, especially in the realm of the ocean space, by reminding us of all of the definition of change. Change. It's an act or process through which something becomes distinctly different. Throughout history, we have experienced multiple iterations of change. From the Industrial Revolution, that recalibrated the economic and social landscape to the digital revolution. Each era has marked a significant point in human progress. Human innovation has driven these advancements to enhance our quality of life, to expand our access to resources, and to foster economic mobility. In this relentless pursuit of progress, however, a critical stakeholder was often overlooked, our natural environment. As a global society, our singular focus on improvement, defined narrowly through the lens of profit, return on investment, and growth, has led us down a path where planetary costs of progress went underestimated and they were, they were ignored. We built, we innovated, and we lived with a vision that saw the natural world not as a precious inheritance to future generations, but as a resource to be exploited for immediate gain. The guiding principles that once seemed to be our North Star, profit, return, and growth, have in their wake left the planet grappling with the consequences of unchecked development. Our ocean, air, and soil bear the scars of industrialization while climate change poses an existential crisis to humanity itself. This reflection is not an indictment of progress itself, but a call to redefine what true progress means. It's a call to place environmental stewardship at its heart. At the heart of our collective endeavors, in a way that we can heal and regenerate our planet. As we stand in this crossroads of history, we are tasked with forging a new path one that harmonizes economic ambitions with ecological sustainability. 
The need of the hour is not to stop progress, but to recalibrate our goals, to measure success not just by the wealth that we accumulate, but by the health of our planet. It's a call to innovate responsibly, to build economies that thrive on renewable energy, to champion policies that support our environment, and to foster a culture that values sustainability over short-term goals. Coming back to the change definition as an act or a process through which something becomes different, change is actually a beacon of hope for all of us. It reminds us that just as we have engineered societies with immense technological potential, we also have the power to architect this future to honor our planet. A future where progress and sustainability are inextricably linked, guiding us to a world where it's not only prosperous, but also sustainable for existing and future generations. As we embrace this vision of progress and environmental stewardship, just imagine this following scenario. What if, what if we could disrupt every single industry out there so that instead of contributing to the destruction of our planet, we are instead healing it, regenerating, and sustaining our ocean. This question is not just a, a dream or a thought. It's a call to action, urging us all to undertake a monumental shift in our values. We must hold the act of sustaining, regenerating, and healing our planet to be equal to profit, return, and growth. Imagine a world where businesses do not work against our planet and nature, but rather for it. What if we as human beings demanded this equity to be held true across every dimension of our lives? The implications of such a shift are profound and far-reaching. It means that every decision, every innovation, and every single policy would be made with, with, would be made with thinking about our health, and the well-being of our planet. We stand on this precipice of opportunity, an opportunity to act by building and supporting solutions that align with these values. This is why I founded Sustainable Ocean Alliance at the age of 19. I was in my college dorm room, and I realized that young people simply did not have a seat at the table. I also realized that being the youngest person in the room at a United Nations meeting, that we did not have any type of conversation or concept of solutions. Heads of state, ambassadors, CEOs kept talking about the problems we face. We've all seen the statistics, we've all seen the white papers, but no one, not one single person ever spoke about solutions. As a 19-year-old kid, I sat there waiting for someone to give me hope, someone to say, and this is the blueprint of change, but that never actually happened. And so at Sustainable Ocean Alliance, our goal is to recruit an entire generation to build solutions, to build solutions, to support solutions. And today, I'm going to present you with three options that we provide to everyone out there, whether you are a youth leader, an ecopreneur, as we call them, or an ally, so you can get involved. The first opportunity that we have is to become a young leader. Our youth leadership program supports thousands of young ocean leaders in 168 countries. These youth are on the ground planting coral reefs, planting seagrass forests. They're, they do not have to be convinced that climate change is real because they're experiencing it in every day of their lives. And for us, it's a matter of asking them, how can we support you? How can we support you with funding, with mentorship, with resources? It is these youth leaders that are actually changing the way in which we interact with our planet. We also have youth leaders that are driving campaigns, such as our campaign against deep seabed mining. The picture you see right here is of our youth that were able to guarantee Sustainable Ocean Alliance to be the first youth-led organization to have a seat as an observer at the International Seabed Authority. This is the future. We need to give youth leaders a voice because all the changes that have happened over the past generations have happened without our consent. They have happened without our permission. And so this is why we empower youth globally to make a change. Second of all, we also have 
the world's largest ecopreneur network. We launched the first ever Ocean Accelerator program because we saw that there were so many ecopreneurs out there in this space that had these amazing ideas about supporting ocean solutions. They had no home. And so today I'm going to give you a very brief preview of the ecopreneurs that we have in our ecosystem. We have cruise foam. They are converting discarded shrimp shells into an alternative to styrofoam. So styrofoam usually is a petroleum-based material that never biodegrades. Cruise foam, as an alternative, it's made out of shrimp shells, which will biodegrade really quickly. Bound for blue, wind-assisted propulsion systems for shipping companies to reduce polluting emissions. Bezos, unlocking the power of seaweed to develop seaweed-based packaging. Oceanworks, a global marketplace for recycled plastic materials, leading the effort to connect global demand for sustainable materials with trusted suppliers. These are just some examples, but we have over 300 solutions, both grassroots and both for-profit, that have been part of our ecosystem and network. And third, if you are not leading and being an entrepreneur, or you're not leading and being a, a youth leader, you can be an ocean ally. One of the questions I get all the time is, Daniela, do I have to go back to school to actually help the ocean? Do I have to be a marine biologist? And the answer is no. We need all of you, no matter where you come from, no matter what skills you have. We need lawyers, we need artists, we need educators. We need all of you to find a way in and find a way to support our planet. And being an ally means that you're united to this large community of people that are dedicating their lives and doing their part, not only feeling that aggravation, that climate anxiety that we all feel, but actually rolling up their sleeves and doing something. And so over the years, with the support of scientists and entrepreneurs and investors and experts in this space, we're always looking for new ways to innovate, to better support these ocean startups and these ocean companies. And it is why I am very, very thrilled to announce here at Change Now that in partnership with the Solar Impulse Foundation, Sustainable Ocean Alliance is launching the Sustainable Ocean Alliance Impact Solution label. The industry's first seal of approval certifying businesses that contribute to the sustainability of the ocean. We want to make sure that we can provide, collaborate, and support all of these startups in this space that are doing the work, that are trying to measure their impact. And so by getting access to this label, they will have that opportunity. In collaboration with the Solar Impulse Foundation, this label marks a significant milestone in vetting and certifying these businesses that are stewards of our ocean via their impact with a best-in-class stamp of approval. Over the years, Sustainable Ocean Alliance has thought very hard what is ocean impact and how can we actually measure it? And so we developed our own framework. We're the first ones in this space to create a framework and impact methodology to ensure that we can support ocean entrepreneurs, ocean investors in measuring their impact. So with this label, we will be able to open up our doors to have more startups apply and receive the support of impact measurement. And so with this, I leave you with the most important thing you will ever do. And that is to decide, to decide how you're actually going to do your part in this space. What is the role you're going to play? Whether it be an ecopreneur building a solution, or joining our large community of young ocean leaders, or simply becoming an ally, being a mentor, being a volunteer, doing your part. Every single one of us has a role to play, because this fight is the greatest fight of our lifetime. And it's not just to preserve and conserve our planet. It's frankly to save and conserve our future and that of our families. So thank you so much for being a part of this movement. And we look forward to welcoming you into Sustainable Ocean Alliance family. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Fantastic. Wow, what an announcement. What an announcement. Do we have any ecopreneurs in the room as I speak? Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, you know where you need to go. Do we have any youth leaders? Brilliant. Welcome, 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 welcome. 
don't be shy. Don't be shy. This is the place to own it. That is an ally. That is an ally. How many allies do we have in the room? Come on, hands up, hands up. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, so to carry on this conversation around how we are going to take action for our ocean, it is a, a real pleasure to welcome uh, my next speaker. He believes that the key to protecting our ocean is to inspire people to fall in love with it through powerful images and stories. And he makes films in local languages which honor the cultural knowledge, and that's the way he empowers communities to act to conserve the ocean. His film, Bahari Yeti, won the Howard Hall Award of Excellence in the 2021 Ocean Geographic Picture of the Year competition. And it was instrumental in the creation of a new locally managed marine area in the Lamu Archipelago. He uh, inspires a new generation of ocean explorers who will champion marine conservation and inspire young people in their communities. And he's here for a fireside chat. Please welcome National Geographic Explorer and co-founder of East Africa Ocean Explorers, Jahawi Batoli. Thank you very much. It's so lovely to meet you here in person after all the Zoom calls in the lead up to this, uh, this very special day. Can we start, first of all, with what your personal connection is to the ocean? Well, I think we're all connected to the ocean because it is vital to the health of the planet. But my personal connection started very young. Um, we had a house on the south coast of Kenya, and it was such a wild place. So. The best thing was getting up at like sunrise, running down to the beach and just exploring. So it was just this magical world where I could get so lost in. Um, and somehow my mum was fine with it that I'd, as long as I was back by sun, sunset, it was okay. Um, but that inspired just this love of the ocean. And that's when I was six. So seeing everything with such bright, vibrant colors and all the fish was just incredible. But you, you're... Your, in, your uh, career took a slightly unexpected turn, which saw you DJing in London. <laughs> and he's now filming documentaries of the ocean in East Africa. So can you tell us how that story unfolds? Well, it's, it's quite funny, actually, because growing up in Kenya, being so connected um, to such an incredible country, such biodiversity, really instilled um, the love of the wild. And I mean, I started catching snakes when I was eight, and um, that drove my mum a bit crazy. Um, but everyone thought for sure I was going to work in conservation. And I was 13 years old, we were at a party. I'm quite an introvert. And at this party, there was a DJ, and I, and I saw, I was like, so the DJ can be involved in the party and not have to talk to anyone. So that's quite a fun way of going out. <laughs> um, and that kind of started this um, love affair with music. So I ended up, um, from age of 15, I was DJing in clubs. Um, by the time I was 18, my first gig was in Fabric in London and played Ministry of Sound and ended up working for Fatboy Slim. And it was an incredible incredibly fun time, probably too much fun. But there came a point where I was missing home, having grown up in Kenya, you know, and each time I went back on holiday, I was like, I want to be back home. Um, and it was the time that dance music was just getting quite big in the States, and I was having, like, arguments with my record label, and I'm at a Christmas party, I met someone, and we got talking, and he did musical film. And this was this whole new way where you, had, you could compose whatever you wanted because it was for film. And that brought me back to, why am I sitting here composing? I want to be out there telling stories. But during this whole process as I grew up, I would go back to the places I loved going and I started noticing changes in the ocean. And in Kenya, we're so good at terrestrial conservation and when you think about Kenya, everyone just thinks about, you know, lions and this and that. And, 
but no one's talking about our ocean. And I realized I was witnessing firsthand from when I was a kid the changes that were happening, and no one was talking about it. And if no one can see it and no one's talking about it, no one's doing anything about it. So that was kind of that moment that I realized. Yes, yeah, suddenly, it. how do we get people to think about it when so few of us actually go to the deep into the ocean? Yeah. Um, before we find out more about the work and the stories that you tell, can you maybe describe to us what life is like on the coast in, in Kenya? Who lives there? Who, what it's like to work there? What even the population that live there? And what the challenges are specifically that you're seeing uh, in that part of, of the world when it comes to ocean? So Kenya has a really long history on coastal communities. Um, when most people think of the Swahili coast, everyone naturally goes to Zanzibar. But actually, Lamu is the oldest still-inhabited Swahili settlement, older than Zanzibar. And so you have this seafaring culture that has been there for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, plying the trade routes and you know, Lamu is still one of the last few places. You've got the traditional dhows that go out, and it's, um, there are very many different traditional ways of fishing. Um, but in a booming economy, the, the coastal population has grown exponentially, so fishing pressure has become quite big. But the problem is we have, for example, Kenya selling its fishing rights to China to build a road. So all of a sudden, you've got these big trawlers who are coming in who are making it a lot harder for your local fishermen. Um, and at the same time, you're talking about marine protected areas, but these communities are never really brought to the conversation, yet they're the ones who utilize and have been utilizing this resource for a long time. Um, so now more than ever, we need to be working with these communities. And I was at the Blue Ocean Economy Conference in Nairobi in, I don't remember, and it was a couple of years ago. There was two conservation organizations there. That's it. The rest was talking about utilization of the blue economy. And I was like, but you can't have utilization of the blue economy without conservation and sustainability. Mm -hmm. So even more so, that's why it's very important to get cultures and communities on board and that's so that they have a voice that they can come to these things and say, well, this is our resource. This is where we've been. Listen to us. So you didn't pick an easy subject. <laughs> um, what have you found are the ways in to, to, to invite local communities into this world? Because most of them, some of them will experience the ocean, mm. but there may be a divide between those who aren't involved in the ocean at all. So how have you found ways to invite them into that, into that world? Um, I can tell you, it's actually, being a filmmaker and photographer, it's very tricky because a lot of what's happened in East Africa is filmmakers, photographers come in, shoot, and leave, and never really engage that deeply with the community. Um, and then the stories are made in Bristol. And so coming in to a community to want to make films, there's a lot of hesitation because they don't know what you're going to do, do with it. Um, when we were making Bahari Yetu, we wanted to make sure that it would talk to the audience, to the communities. So we spent a lot of time getting to know the fishermen, getting to know the different people involved, and also trying to understand is like, what is the cultural knowledge? What's the folklore of the ocean from that culture? Can we make the film based on the culture, based on like a story that comes from the culture? And more importantly, can we make it in the local language? Because if you're gonna do conservation, everyone forgets that you have to work with the people who live in those environments and in those wild spaces. And so, if you're gonna have a film, it's, you know, we see it, it's so much better to be able to watch a film that you understand in your local language. Because it also gives you a sense of ownership of that. And I suppose so much of the conversa conservation content that we see comes from other parts of the world, so it's, yeah there is that psychological dis distance that, that, that you can't really unblock. So what has been the response when you come into a community? Maybe you can tell us how you actually engage the community. Do you have you know, community popcorn nights where you watch, the, um, um, you, you know, you watch your films together? How do you actually engage the community? And what is the response when they see what is happening on their, on their doorstep? 
So, so one of the hats I wear is also in conservation um, with the Lama Marine Conservation Trust. And a lot of conservation oriented films about the ocean that a lot of people use are made in Australia, are made in the States. And when you're showing that, the message may be right, but if you're showing that to a fisherman in Lamu, he's, he'll be like, okay, great film, but how does this relate to me? Because that's something far away. When you show a film that was made in the areas they fish, and a lot of the fishermen don't swim. They don't go snorkeling. So they may not understand why the fishing is bad because they don't understand what's going on under the water. Now, when we came in and we filmed it and we did, what was very important is the first people we showed the film to were the elders who we interviewed and asked them, is this right? Is this the right message? Are you happy for us? Before I even sent it to Nat Geo, I was like, we need to honor the fact that you've given us this knowledge and your time, and we need to make sure that that message that's going out is correct. Now, it was actually really sweet. One of the, the fishermen actually got his grandkids to like run around the village to call all the other kids, and they watched it seven times in a row, which was incredibly special. Um, and they said, thank you, this is our film. It's not your film, this is our film. Now, when you can see a degraded reef as a fisherman and make sense that that's that area and this is why the fishing is bad, the first question that comes is, okay, what can we do to, to change this? What can we do to stop it? Now that protection comes from that community and it becomes a community-driven project. And that's how you can have success. And so when we propose the new marine protected area around the areas that we filmed, we do, we do these big community meetings, show the film, we have other films that we've done. You're team, your core supporter is that community, and they now want to understand the tools that they need to be able to protect more of the ocean. And so all of a sudden, you've got your biggest stakeholder on your side, and it doesn't, it's their project. And now what we're doing is we're helping to like, create the management plan, we're bringing in scientists to make sure we're doing it right. You know, we're providing the support the best we can to help the community. And then a lot of things, like then that's how you're going to manage that area, you know, that's how you're going to control excessive fisheries because it's not that you're going to put 100 rangers out patrolling, it's the fishermen out there who are traditional fishermen will be going up to the people saying, no, you're not allowed to fish like this in our waters. And there's huge power in that. Even against some, against some of the big tankers from, is really that they can, yeah. they can fight against that, that's incredible. Well, well, you know, a lot of the time is, you know, we think about local communities may not be highly educated, it, but it's, the, it's a change in language. Because mm. the knowledge is there, they just don't know how to communicate it sometimes in the way that you'd say it scientifically on the conservation world. Um, once you empower that voice and kind of align the two different languages, you realize they're so, they're so interlinked. Um, and then the fishermen and the community can go to the county government and say, no, we want to do it this way, you know? So in Lamuf, we are hopefully gonna be the second coastal county to actually have a land use, I mean, an ocean use plan, where they're gonna say, this is for traditional fishing, these are breeding zones, this is the type of fishing that can happen here. And it's now a community voice that's saying it, so your county government will have to listen to you. Mm. What uh, role does the intergenerational um, part play? Because you've talked about the elders, but they have then involved their grandchildren. So can you talk us through, you know, we need everybody to be doing this, not just the elders. How have you found engaging the different generations and, and what are you learning from each one? So what was quite interesting with Bahari Yetu is we had actually set out to do a humpback whale film um, because the humpback whale migration has come back to Kenya and we we thought there's going to be a lot of human-wildlife conflict. And it just so happens that with humpback whales, whenever I set out to film them, something happens. Like, there, so we had the Indian Ocean dipole, which is like El Nino of the Indian Ocean. Humpback whales didn't show up. And we'd been talking to elders about humpback whales, and they were like, no, the problem is, yes, they're whales, they come, they go. The real problem is, is that the younger generation thinks that the ocean they're fishing in now is normal but they don't want to listen to us when we say this isn't normal. 
so that's where we realize, hold on, we, this is what the message that needs to be told because there's a lot of, and we're seeing it a lot now, you can lose so much culture and information from the generation that's going because a younger generation may not think it's cool or interesting, but it's, there's, that's science, that's you know, observational science for a long time. Um, and in Africa, we still have quite a close sense of our culture, but in a lot of the Western world, you're losing that sense of where do you come from, who are you, who am I as a person, and I think a lot of young people are losing that. You know, they don't have that sense of home, this is my culture, this is where I come from. So it's trying to make people realize that that is really such a grounding for you. Mm. And, you know, in Africa we do very much, you know, we talk about the elders and learning from the elders, but there's an emotional grounding to that. Um, now, we've been figuring out, can we make, you know, can we take a 10 minute film, make one, I mean, 10 one minute films that you can send on WhatsApp? But what's incredibly important is you need to start, for the younger generation, they need to start pe seeing people who look like them in positions on TV as the scientist, as the underwater photographer, as this, you know, as the mar marine biologist. And then all of a sudden, it's like, if you can see yourself in that role, you become connected to that issue or to the ocean or to um, my wife makes coloring books you know to get kids interested but so we hired for this project we had a fantastic marine biologist called Teresa and we do school outreach programs and now she leads them and now when you ask the kids in the school what do you want to be most of the time it was doctor lawyer you know that you know now a lot of the girls are saying we want to be marine biologists and we want to be conservationists, because they've seen someone who looks like them and who's incredible and doing incredible work. And then the kids will go back and say, like, they're really cool people, we want to study the ocean, we want to do this. You know, we do a bunch of awareness about plastic pollution. We have kids telling off their parents about throwing stuff away. And you know. getting back into the families and back into the, exactly. into the adults, into the adults that we need to. So you've just come back from a week in the field or the ocean. <laughs> um, what can you tell us about that experience and um, any projects that we should be following in 2024 that are, that are coming up? How can we support you? So... Literally, the last day we were filming was on Thursday. And it was for a shoot where we were supposed to cover the biodiversity in the Indian Ocean. And it was heartbreaking. It was, I'm still trying to process it, but the water temperature is 31 degrees. At 25? At 25 meters deep. Wow. The area of Kinika where we're trying to protect, I reckon about 40% of the coral has died off. And I, we've, we've, this whole project, we've done the whole Kenyan coast, and it is terrifying, to say the least. It's actually terrifying. Um, in some areas, the surface temperature was 32 degrees. And it was, what, four years since the last El Nino, and our reefs are just not getting enough time to recover. And I'm particularly worried that the same reefs that I saw and that I love as I grew up, my kids may not see that reef. It may just be dead substrate. If, and that's terrifying. And at one point, it's like, well, why are we doing this? You know, it might as well just give up because it's such a big issue. But then it's like, hold on a minute. This is why we're doing what we're trying to do. Because if we collectively come together just in places like this, and realize that we all need to do it and we're all part of the solution and we all have power to be part of the solution because we have to do it. Because this is not about, well, let's save the coral reefs. No, this is about s saving the world, making it hospitable for humanity. Place we can live. Yeah. yeah, and for the kids that come. And we have a huge responsibility to do everything we can to try and restore the balance of this ecosystem because it's about us. It's about protecting us, and it's about protecting the ocean and the world for the future generations. And living with that reality where there will be days when you feel really down and days when you, it motivates you and is the driving force. Mm. And I think it's important for all of us in this room to remember that we all get that. Mm. Uh, but you still came here to change now to, to, uh, to deliver your message. 
Um, where can we go and watch your? Um, where can we go and watch your documentary? How can we help and support you? Um, yeah, tell us, tell us what, how we can be allies. So my wife and I have a. Um, an uh, organization called East African Ocean Explorers. East African Ocean Explorers. Yeah, okay. East African Ocean Explorers. And our aim is, you know, like, I was once considered, like, the only African underwater cameraman, and that's ridiculous. And we need more, because these stories need to come from many voices. So we're trying to train more people to get connected with the ocean. We have university students studying ocean sciences who have never seen the sea who have never gone diving. You know, there's all these crazy things, so we were kind of figuring out what can we do to connect people who want to learn more about the ocean or are studying the ocean or who want to become filmmakers or scientists, how can we create an organization that will help them connect to the ocean? Um, we run dive labs where we, we took two photographers, a Kenya Wildlife Service ranger um, and two scientists and did dive training for them so they could actually go out and dive, which helps their work. Um, we work with an organization called Newfin South Africa where they're building a dive center, but we need more champions for the ocean and we need more local voices, you know, who can actually talk about it. And they will become the champions in their community because they'll see these things firsthand. Um, so we want to roll out that program much bigger to be able to train a lot more people um, on the Kenyan coast. Um, if you search East African Ocean Explorers, Bahari Yatu, the film is on there, and there's a bunch of um, um, other films we've done. I mean, the dream goal is to get a catamaran that actually can go and stop in different places around East Africa. And then the idea is we can invite the scientists onto the boat to study a particular thing that they're interested, and then pair them up with a young person who's a photographer who can come and talk about and photograph the work that they're doing to tell that story. Because it's one thing to do incredible science, but how do you now get that message to the wider audience? We have a communication problem, that's exactly right. We do. Yeah. Um, and again, it's different languages, because yeah. we're all storytellers. Yes. But we need so many storytellers who are covering things and inspiring the next generation, because we need this to continue. Well, thank you ever so much for your time today. You're not rushing off, are you? So if yes. anybody wants to uh, come and connect uh, with Jahawi at the end of the session, uh, then he's not rushing off. So, uh, uh, But thank you for everything, for choosing this mission, and thank you for coming to tell us about it and choosing Change Now as your platform. We really appreciate it. Please give him a big round of applause, everybody. Thank, thank you so you. much. Okay. Mm, thank you. So we're going to come on to a second panel uh, where we're going to discuss a little bit more about uh, the oceans. But before we do, it is my utter privilege to share with you a very special experience. And I am not going to spoil it by telling you anything about it. I am just going to ask you to welcome MK de Canart uh, to give us something very unique.
Thank you. So I'm happy to say that MK is going to come and join us uh, for this next discussion. Uh, so if I can please welcome our second panel. Uh, Santiago Lefebvre, founder and CEO of Change Now. We've also got Christian Leem from uh, Sven Blue Ocean. And of course, the delightful MK, who is, get this for a job title, uh, a professional violinist, expedition leader, and ocean activist. If you can please join me on stage. Thank you, thank you. Come on down, come sit, sit down. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for that moving, moving tribute and yeah, a pleasure. reminder of, you know, it's hard to imagine that that is happening at the same time as us being here at Change Now. Um, so before we go into our conversation, let me introduce uh, these three wonderful people. So Santiago, if we can start with you. Um, you believe that the civil society has the power to bring about positive change. Um, following a, a short stint as a banker in finance earlier on in his career, it wasn't long and took he, until he took his first entrepreneurial steps uh, in 2010 before finally really settling into his mission where he could embrace positive impact, helping change makers around the globe connect and collaborate. He set up Change Now in 2016 and has become a key influential figure both in France and internationally. Seven years on, he continues to push the limits of what's possible and is why we are here today. So please put it together for Santiago. We, uh, we then have um, uh, MK uh, de Kenart, who uh, really believes you can make a difference by doing what you love. And I think you've seen firsthand how that plays out. You know, the it's not necessarily the most obvious leap to have uh, violin playing and ocean conservation, but you've made it work. Uh, growing up in the US before moving to Belgium, she brought together a love of the ocean and music to research the impact of sound pollution in ocean life. Today, she's an experienced skipper, violinist, marine biologist, and activist who is leading a global movement to fight deep sea mining. And I can tell you now, you will have some actions to take on this before you leave this room. Uh, and she's here to tell us about why the ocean needs our help more than ever. So please welcome MK. And last but certainly not least, we have Christian Leem, who believes in aligning science finance and conservation to reverse the decline of our oceans. With years of experience in strategy, operations, finance, spanning regions like Africa, Europe, and Asia, he has had roles at companies like Viola, Saint-Gobain, Africa Invest, and that gave him unique insights into understanding how fintech and innovation could impact the health of our oceans. He launched the world's first dedicated ocean fund to address the ocean's rapid decline and has changed now to thank for his first big success, which I'm sure you'll tell us more about. And he's here to help us uh, understand the latest developments in ocean innovation. So welcome, Christian, if you can put your hands together. So we are here in this incredible room with one of the sim, like, best backdrops you could hope for in Paris or in the world. Uh, and I'd like to start uh, with your, each of your personal relationships with the ocean, you know, why the ocean was important to you. And Christian, if we can start with you, what was it that makes you care about the ocean so much? Uh, to me, it's been free diving since I'm a kid. Um, I experienced uh, the ocean in, in the Med Mediterranean, actually, with my best friend who's from uh, Palma de Mallorca. And uh, as a kid, he would dare, you know, we would, would dare each other to go and reach some, uh, you know, some rock at the bottom or catch, uh, you know, see a, a shipwreck or and things like this. And that's how I, I developed, um, uh, I think, a very direct relationship with the ocean because actually when you're down there and you don't have scuba gear, you're just, you're just yourself and, uh, you know, you hear everything uh, when you're free diver, there are no bubbles and you... Um, um, yeah, the, the fish, they come and check you out and uh, uh, you hear them talk to each other and so it really feels 
for a minute or two <laughs> that you're, you're part of it. So that's my connection. Thank you. What about you, MK? Um, well, there's a bit of the same experience with swimming as a young kid, but then also sailing. So I started, I was very lucky to start as a young kid, thanks to my parents. Um, and having this kind of dual, dual connection with the ocean, one on the surface where I could go far, I was on my little optimist, you know, and you feel like you're, you can sail the world like that. And kind of knowing also as well what happens underneath um, allowed me to have a more global vision in which I kept pushing more and more along the years, so which brought me to study marine biology because it seemed like the only obvious way of studying something like that. Um, and then I was also playing violin, and as I grew up, people would kind of say, like, yeah, you should play, you should play music with whales. I was like, no, that's way too cheesy. I'm never going to do that. <laughs> and here I am. <laughs> On a stage in Paris doing just that. Sorry, I'm just going to make sure I take this off. If I can ask you the same thing, Santiago. Of course. Well, my personal ocean is the Mediterranean Sea, uh, actually. <laughs> I, I'm come from, I have Spanish origins, and the Mediterranean Sea is, a, you know, is the mother sea for me. So uh, there is a link first with the sea and then with ocean. Uh, I would say that for me, it's a bit different because I don't think I'm an ocean expert. I'm more an ocean lover, you know? And my expertise is, uh, I think we'll be able to, to talk more about this, but my expertise is more on systems change, on how to activate people and ecosystems. But I think that now it's really time to activate um, the ecosystem and all the resources we can have strategically for the sake of the ocean. And so that's why uh, I think it's uh, very important to have these kind of sessions here at Change Now uh, and all year long. So yeah, I mean, coming to the ocean, we are facing some really critical moments. We know that the ocean has uh, taken or absorbs 90% of the heat uh, from the planet. It also is our biggest carbon sink um, in terms of actually absorbing CO2 emissions. Um, and we see every month uh, incredible skyrocketing temp water temperatures and sea temperatures, as we were just hearing in the, in the last panel. So if we can maybe start with you, Santiago, it, it does seem like there is a disconnect between the importance and the role that oceans play and yet the action that we see. So can you maybe give us more of a sense as to why the oceans are so important and how, we, how you see we can change and, and make it more of a priority? Um, great question. Actually, the ocean is very important because, as you mentioned, one of two um, breath of air we take comes from the ocean. And there is also, this is also the, the resource for so many people on Earth for their food and, and many other things. Um, and on top of that, indeed, there is about uh, the, 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 the fact that it's a, a huge carbon pump. Um, but for me, I think that the, the, the issue is that the immensity of ocean makes it difficult sometimes to rely to it, you know? It's like not, uh, like the, it's a bit different when you have a garden and you put some plants, you can see grow and die, and this is very visual. The ocean is a bit more difficult. And I needed to have some very concrete images to, to have that in mind. And one that marked me most is the fact that the size of fishes are, uh, are diminishing, you know? Uh, the, um, the tuna fish, uh, a few years ago, it was very big. It was three, uh, three, uh, un until three meters long. Now they say that it's around one meter, I think. Uh, so it really diminished. And this is due to the fact that we have a lot of overfishing. And, and when you see that in a picture, you say, wow, that's really stunning. So I think that for the ocean, we need to to see things. Um, and so work like um, what Jahawi is doing and others, I think is key because that shows really the, the reality of ocean situation. And I understand Change Now has got some exciting plans around the ocean this year in 2024. Yes, so um, I was mentioning, yes, our role definitely and our um, um, expertise is more on developing strategies of ecosystems. And for me, there are two main battles we need to do for the next uh, 18 months, uh, at least. Uh, first one is there is a huge conference happening in Nice and, um, and Monaco next year, which is the UNOC, the UN Ocean Conference. Uh, and this is something where the ambitions are um, the one like COP, 
uh, for the ocean, and it would be great to achieve an agreement like the COP, uh, like the Paris Agreement for the ocean. But the fact is, that to do that, we need to have the all civil society, all the entrepreneurs, all the NGOs, uh, all the knowledge and ecosystem uh, focusing on that also. Otherwise, we don't have the critical mass to really push uh, the negotiations. Because we here, and I would say for me, um, we have sometimes a very European-centric uh, focus, but the idea of how much we manage ocean in the world is, might be very different, so we need to, to have this critical mass. And this is something we're doing, for example, with, uh, with uh, uh, great partners uh, we are, we are working with for many years, like uh, Respect Ocean, like the 1000 Ocean Startups, uh, SOA, and others. So this is the first one. UNOC, super important to have in the radar. And the second one, it's the deep sea mining. For me, it's one of the key battles we have to fight for uh, in the next five years, uh, because it's now, th there are some countries, and you'll tell much, much better than I could do, uh, there are some one countries, but nothing is done so far, uh, knowing that on top of that, nothing is written etern eternally. You always have some wins and some loss, uh, loss. and so we need to be very uh, careful about that. And we have a moment, haven't we? A, a very special moment in time, MK, to stop and prevent um, deep sea mining. So can you tell us first why deep sea mining is just taking off now and what is, what is attractive about it and why it's, 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 uh, it's building a momentum now? And then more, most importantly, what we as, a, as ocean allies can do to, to, to help the, the, the movement. All right, so deep sea mining. Um, it's about getting those minerals that are at 4,000 meters down where basically, I mean, very few people have even been there. Um, and we want to go and grab all those metals to create everything we think we need for a green transition, right? So we all think we're going to need billions of cars and all the electronics possible. And so people are getting ready for that, as in we're going to need that someday, so we might as well just go get it now. When, in fact, we're not even close to being there, so we have to stop it before that even happens because they think it's also a better way to do that than staying on land and on landmines, which is not true either. I mean, if we open deep sea mining, that it's never going to stop what's happening on land. So it's definitely not an excuse. And what is happening right now is the negotiations in Kingston, in Jamaica. So it's called the International Seabed Authority, with a bunch of states that are discussing about the mining code, um, whether or not to allow these companies and startups to go mine. And so what we want to do is to be sure that they, they do not do that. But we have on one side the government, we have all the citizens, and we have startups who are just doing lobbying all over the place, and so it's a big mess, and we're trying to do what we can, each person on their side, to change the, each state's mind to be against deep sea mining. So we do have a few champs in states that have already started to join the moratorium, so the moratorium is something to ban deep sea mining and not allow these countries to go. And we have a few champ in states, France is one of them, they pronounced um, their favor to the moratorium two years ago. And the idea is really to talk, I mean, to know about it first, what it is, and also be sure that it is not the solution, because what does it bring? It's biodiversity loss at these 4,000 meters of depth. We're going to destroy completely what has been there for millions of years, and there's no way of getting, of getting it back. When we talk about carbon compensation and paying back, I mean, there's no even possible way to pay back what exists down there. And it's going to have an impact on climate, like you said, the carbon sink. We're going to be destroying that whole carbon sink that has been there for years as well. Um, it has an impact on fisheries because tuna is migrating towards the Pacific Ocean right now. They are getting ready to mine the Pacific Ocean, um, this clarion Clipperton zone, it's called. So that's going to have a huge impact on fisheries as well. And then human impact as well because they've noticed that, there's, that these polymetallic nodules are radioactive as well. So all of this has to stay in the ocean. It has... It doesn't, it's, it shouldn't be even a viable option. Um, what should be an option is recycling all these electronic devices that we have. It's stopping our consummation. It's, it's, I mean, it's finding these other solutions of circular energy, just reducing loads of things that we already know we have to reduce. So everyone is already aware of this. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the crazy part. We know, we know we have to do something about it. But now as a citizen, what you can do 
because we often feel just completely useless in our chairs. Um, what you can do is join the fight online. It's a very first, very easy way to join. Um, so what I can ask you to do now is go on this Instagram page called Lookdown Action. So Lookdown Action is um, a protest, it's a, it's a citizen protest that activates each country that is close to join the moratorium and asks the citizen to make some noise so the government is also aware of what is happening and will change their, their minds about this deep sea mining and then be opposed to that, which will then grow the number of states that are against it and then just, be, just stop these companies from just going forward because once it's allowed, it's, it's done. It's hard to turn right. off, it's hard to turn off. So exactly. you have our permission to look exactly. away from the stage and get your phones out. When have you ever heard this at a conference? Get Instagram and it's look down action. From there's the a, sorry, yeah, there's a story that I posted with a beautiful picture of the Eiffel Tower and a link to sign a petition to join, um, to, to make some noise in America because the US is now also starting to get interested in deep sea mining, which we absolutely don't want. So if you can sign that petition, that would mean a lot to all of us. Thank you. Okay, thank you, MK. So, yeah, <laughs> it's powerful. It's powerful. So, Christian, we have on one hand, we have behavior change, never sexy, always hard, very necessary. But you talk to us about innovation. So, first of all, maybe tell us a little bit about the state of ocean innovation, because you, when you set up your fund, was the first ever dedicated ocean fund and that was in 2018, is that right? Yeah, 2018 was when uh, Olivier and I, who's here as well, uh, got the idea to, to create this fund called the Blue Ocean. Uh, and, uh, but it took us a few years to get it uh, actually uh, up and running. So 2021 is the year when we launched it. Uh, back in 2018, um, we, you know, we had identified, uh, because you know, we were looking at innovation at that time, it was in FinTech. Uh, and started seeing innovations that had solutions to uh, the main threats to the ocean. So we're talking about solutions to, um, to overfishing, um, like smart fishing gear that reduce bycatch, for example. Or we were looking at solutions to plastic pollution, so it could be advanced recycling uh, technologies or you know, alternatives to uh, the plastic fibers that we have in 60% of our clothes and end up in the ocean when we wash our clothes or you know, solutions to climate change. So we were seeing the solutions, but uh, and, you know, uh, we were seeing incredible opportunity uh, for impact, but also to transform very important industries like the seafood industries, the apparel industry. And so it's obvious there must be funds investing in that. And uh, we looked around and uh, looked up, looked down, <laughs> and didn't see anything. So you know, Olivier and I, we decided that uh, it was the right time to you know, jump in the sea literally and uh, you know, uh, create our jobs and create this fund. So that was the state at this at that time. So fast forward 2021, we launched the fund with Swan Capital Partners, um, aimed at raising uh, 120 million euros, ended up raising 170 million euros. Um, and I think, of course, that was a milestone because it was the first fund in this space and, and, and it's been the, lar the largest for some time. Uh, but very important milestone as well, uh, we've been able to onboard institutional investors. So the likes of uh, you know, insurance companies, banks, and pension funds uh, on a strategy that is absolutely uncompromising. That's, that's been the philosophy from the beginning. Uncompromising on both impact, achieving impact at systemic scale, uh, and, um, and achieving competitive, uh, you know, market returns. And so, so we were able to convince institutional investors that what, that was possible. Uh, so that's been a milestone, and then we, at the ten, same time, we co-founded 1,000 Ocean Startups, so a coalition of incubators, accelerators, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, and venture capital funds like us, investing in, uh, in Ocean Startups. Uh, we were six members at the time, there were the likes of uh, Catapult uh, Ocean, there was a Conservation International uh, Builders Vision, which is an American family office. Uh, just six of us, and now we are, um, uh, we're 43 members from all over the world, Australia, Cape Town, uh, Oslo, San Francisco. Uh, we, um, we have back together more than 350 startups. Uh, the goal was 1,000, hence the name of, uh, is 1,000, hence the name 1,000 Ocean Startups. And uh, together we manage uh, uh, you know, north of 1.5 billion euros. At that time when we were created, it was 
you know, maybe a few hundred uh, uh, million. So this is growing exponentially at the pace of, uh, you know, innovation. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's the pace you see with the Facebooks, the Teslas of this world. And that's why we want. we want this pace, but uh, for ocean impact. And how can ocean, the e ocean innovation space respond to the very specific challenges that your colleagues, for example, whether it's responding to deep sea mining or responding to a very specific event in the ocean industry diary, how can we align those two together? Or does innovation do its thing and then everybody else has to do their thing? Can you tell us a bit about that? I think, um, you know, Santi, you, you mentioned that the key is to achieve, you know, we're facing systemic problems, so we need to achieve systemic change. Uh, so clearly everything we do is, is connected, and the ocean is what is connecting all of us. And so what you're doing, you know, uh, on activism, you know, trying to influence regulation uh, laws, and, uh, uh, you know, what we do on the innovation, of course, is completely connected. Um, the one way it's connected is that... Um, um, if, if you look at um, achieving systemic change, uh, it's fundamentally about changing behaviors. Uh, and to ch change behaviors, change systems, uh, we see, you know, maybe in an overly simplified way, but it's, it's a practical way to look at it, we see three main levers. The first one is, is awareness, and, uh, uh, you know, it can be science, it can be activism, which is a kind of awareness which is closer to action. Um, the, uh, the second one is, is regulations and standards, so you know, that's also what you're trying to influence, changing laws and things like that. And, uh, um, and, uh, and then the third one is innovation. Um, and so what all of the three le le levers, the, the, the aim to achieve is, is to change behavior, and you need the three of them to really change behavior you know, uh, profoundly, which is w what we need. And so um, you know, if, you, if you look at... Um, for example, uh, you know, solutions to, uh, to deep sea mining. One of them is to offer an alternative that is sustainable, competitive on price and performance. And so if you can get a solution, a startup, that will help uh, recycle those you know, mineral materials uh, that are in our you know, um, uh, you know, electronic devices at the end of their life, can do it in a way that is economical, then there was not going to be a need for deep sea mining. So that's the type of solution we're, we're looking for uh, through our firm. And it really does transcend the fact that there's, it could be nothing to do with the ocean, but by recycling those minerals, you are actually helping the ocean. So it shows how integrated these are. So we don't have much time, but I would like to ask each of you, you know, if everything goes right in the next 12 months, what are we celebrating here at Change Now 2025? So things go our way. What are you celebrating, Santiago? What have we achieved? Uh, actually, I will have a response between your question and, and the end of what Christian uh, said. Is that I believe that indeed there is this question of, uh, of um, uh, alternatives, and we have a lot of alternatives here uh, that are viable, etc. But I think that there is also time, and I would like to celebrate that also next year, is that we still live in a world where sometimes we agree that the private interests um, are, are more important than the common interest. You know? And for example, deep sea mining for me is that, it's that the fact that just a few people would get a lot of private interest from deep sea mining, but a lot of uh, good uh, common uh, goods that will just disappear. So I hope that we, one day we'll just uh, manage to celebrate the reverse, and maybe next year, let's, if it's Aim the best high. we can. Aim yeah, high. Exactly. <laughs> no, thank you. And MK, what about you? Very nicely said. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. Um, what we hope for is a global moratorium against deep sea mining. So every country deciding to not go for it and not allow these companies to, to go start these crazy ideas that they have. So one country at a time, we'll get there. We are doing very good for the moment, and we want to keep on going. And it's raising that awareness, isn't it? It's absolutely raising that awareness. Always. Always. Always, always, always going. <laughs> what about you, Christian? So... Uh, if you allow me two, uh, you know, two, um, two, two, two elements, um, you know, the first one wearing my hat as a, as a co-founder of, one of uh, the, 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 the Swan Blue Ocean Fund. Uh, so um, we already, you know, well ahead uh, w uh, writing the first chapter, uh, so deploying already two-thirds of our first fund in 14 uh, amazing, you know, ocean startups. And I would like to encourage you actually to maybe Look them up if you want to have more concrete ideas of uh, what ocean innovations can achieve. Uh, 
you know, you, you, can, you can look up uh, um, swainblueocean.com and you will see the, the companies in our portfolio, how they address climate change, uh, overfishing and, and uh, um, uh, you know, and pollution. Um, and so we should be fully, in, in, uh, you know, committed uh, uh, this year. And so we're already preparing for the next chapter. Uh, uh, and so Warren Bonding partners for, for that. Uh, so. Um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to announce already at the beginning of the next chapter sometime next year, and maybe with some of you here. Uh, and uh, next, uh, I wanted also to mention the work that 1000 Ocean Startups is doing. Um, so, um, you know, the goal is to back at least uh, 1000 transformative ocean startups by the end of the UN Ocean Decade of Science. Uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, next year at the time, uh, uh, we'll be able to, to share where we're standing, but there's good progress in the um, and, uh, and I think, uh, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to showcase really uh, very concrete example, uh, impacts already at a large scale. So, yeah. Well, you heard it here. So uh, we've got this on video. So we'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, so this really does bring uh, to an end this particular session on oceans. But are you feeling motivated? Are you feeling like allies? Are we going to change now? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, well, really, you know, th today's session has been about bringing together the fact that you have an Ocean World First, a certification to showcase just what is uh, happening in ocean innovation. We have storytellers showing us and telling us and inspiring future ocean conservation, uh, conservation leaders just the, the work that we need to do. And here from, today, from this last session, you know that you need to keep in touch or look at the UNOC and what is happening there. Uh, you know that you need to go to Instagram, don't look, uh, the look down action uh, to make sure that you help the world move forward to a global um, moratorium. And with Christian, please do go and um, share, not just with you because you're in the room, but go and share with your friends, your network, your circle of influence, the types of ocean innovation that is already existing today. So thank you everybody for choosing this session. We have loved having you. And thank you to all of our speakers uh, for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.